Hi, I'm Deacon John Wilson, Education Enrichment Director for West Angeles Church. And this is a video taping or video of our meeting uh, for class of 2020, Jumpstart meeting number 21, originally scheduled on May 21st. And uh, if you're seeing this, you probably missed that meeting, or maybe you're just here because someone told you about recording or you're on our on Facebook or our YouTube channel. Whatever it is, welcome, I'm glad you're here. All right, so let's go on and get started. This should, shouldn't take too long, but there's a lot of great information in here. First of all, let's review the effects on COVID, the COVID effects on enrollment. I've been doing that each week because this is a very unusual year and things are moving very fast and they're different from state to state. There's a clear relationship between uh, there's a clear relationship between the state you're in and between the governor of your state, that is, and his or her politics and whether colleges will be open. Many politicians won't shut down until after the election. And then there's some that it's not as important for, so you have to keep that in mind. Depends on the politics in the state you're coming from and also how bad the virus was in the state and how quick the recovery is in the state. Those are all the factors along with the politics of it. Areas where college will have distance learning, New England states it seems like will not, will have distance learning or distance educational delivery, you'll see I call it later. <clears throat> Most mid-Atlantic states, there'll be distance educational delivery. New York City and the areas around New York City, of course, which were the baddest hit in the country. I think something like uh, one third of all the cases are within 150 to 200 miles of New York City in the United States, okay? Uh, then of course the West Coast, and that's where California is. And, and of course that heavily impl implies that I think that colleges will pretty much be doing distance educational delivery in California, including the Los Angeles area. Conflicts between governors and mayors, county executives and mayors, county executives and governors about the op opening will cause confusion uh, to college administrators uh, than what they should be doing. They'll be very confused, the administrators, when they're trying to figure out when they get different direction from county people and city people and then from the governor of the state. Um, and even in some cases from the federal government trying to interpret the various uh, CDC regulations and what they really mean for their state. It's quite confusing time for them. The following colleges, despite all that, have announced that they will have 100% on-campus classes already. Nevada, Reno, Grand Canyon, Boise State, Chapman College, uh, and maybe LMU. Looks like LMU is teetering. But again, all those schools will try to figure out what's you know, what's within the orders of their governor or their mayor. Uh, the California schools will need to get, probably get the governor's approval at least, or, and he has said that schools will be closed through July. So it'll be kind of hard because they can't get staff there till August 1st to get, also have the campuses ready. It's very difficult. CSU just announced four to five months in advance that they will not have classes at the CSU no matter where the CSU is located. And UC followed shortly after that and pretty much said the same thing. It looked like it was, they were saying you could be on campus when you read it carefully. It's very, very, very few students that will be allowed to be on the campus. So you might as well say there'll be distance educational delivery. The governor has placed colleges and churches off into phase three, which means a lockdown until August 1st. It means the governor of California, I should say. That's Gavin Newsom, okay? The conclusion is you need to prepare for distance educational delivery. Um, because 95% of my um, families are in those areas of the country where that's true. I have some students that are at Grand Canyon and Boise State and Nevada, Reno, that, but that's only about five to 10% of my uh, students that are in that situation, about 20 to 30 students, okay? Questions for your orientation. So your orientation is going to be online and I'm going to need you to ask some questions about the distance educational delivery at the schools because now all of a sudden the quality of those programs, as many of you as have learned, have your students home now from high school, that it depends a lot, the 
the quality of the online learning is uh, going to be the question. You had some teachers that were there every day for the students, others that weren't, others that just put work online and have them do it, and then they'll turn their work and get a grade, but no real teacher interaction in those in some cases, okay? And I would say even most cases, if you talk to your student, they're not getting that interaction unless it's a private high school or middle school, okay? Uh, so you have some questions you should be asking. For example, you should ask your colleges, are the online classes synchronous or asynchronous or both? Let me tell you what asynchronous and synchronous means. Synchronous means that it's scheduled at a certain time or times, and that's where a live professor is teaching, and that's where you get taught. Asynchronous means that we'll be using videotapes of instruction or videotapes of drills and things like that, but not the actual um, human being teacher there to answer particular questions. You could see combinations of both, uh, but you need to know that as a consumer, is it gonna be synchronous, asynchronous, or student will just have choices between the two? Um, is it at a specified time the class is, or times, or is it any time you wanna go and there's just a video there, okay? Please ask that question orientation. Also ask them, is your program, is your program taught in person? Or is there going to be an online platform like Zoom? Um, or is it just going to be, you know, go over here and get your work and do it? It becomes independent study then, not really distance learning with a teacher. So ask about that. Will the classes be the same cost as the on-campus courses? And probably so, but it's good for them to hear that question being asked. There are some lawsuits that are coming up that are already entered right now by students in CSU, ironically. To, to attempt to get that distinction made by a judge that on-campus courses are worth more than online courses and therefore there, there should not be a cost difference. So we'll see what comes out of that. But I don't think anything will come out of it. I think it'll be you know, a long, long time and it won't affect this situation. Are you training your traditional teachers to do online teaching? That's another good question to ask the school. Are your traditional teachers getting training to do online teaching? because a traditional teacher may be terrible online. You don't know how to relate to the students at all. So keep that in mind. Have you invested more dollars in your online programs or will they be delivered just like they were last semester? And I can tell you at most C schools, I'm, I heard from students that these online deliveries were not that good. They, they didn't expect it to happen and it showed in the quality of the class. Um, I don't tend to give colleges a break on this. I feel like they're world-class educational institutions, they should, have, and a lot of them have online classes already that are very good. They should have known right away to get those right people in their campuses involved in making that a success. So the question is, have they figured that out? Are they investing more dollars in the online programs? Or will they be delivered just like they were last semester? Please ask that question in orientation. Do I have to prepay for fees, room and board for the second semester? No, do I have to pay the room and board early? get it for the second semester is a very good question. And you should ask that question at orientation, all right? I hope these different questions for orientation make sense, that you'll actually use these questions and maybe you'll come here and tell us how it all went. Summer academic preparation. Taking two to three summer classes is a great idea for a rising college student. Pre-med or health science student should take two classes and including one should be biology. This is a very difficult course for first year students, but that's your truth. Take it again in the fall online. Okay, remember the school's gonna be online. And so you could take, uh, you know, you could take a class now, it'll still be online, uh, and, they'll, uh, and it'll work out just fine for you. Um, they'll be able to get experience doing biology, so they're not surprised by the terminologies and how rigorous the class is. Engineering, business, computer science, take two classes. One should be a math class at a two-year two -year college or from a two-year college. We should say from a two-year college because they'll all be online this semester as I explained a minute ago. College math prep in our 2020 Summer Bridge program for students who are weak in math. If you're a student and, you've, and you know, or your parent, you know your student has always been weak in math, just about every college is gonna require him to take a, a year of math to demonstrate some level of proficiency. 
You know, if you think your student's not going to be ready, I should also say sometimes students are taking science majors where they're going to need to go and get in math eventually all the way up to pre-calculus. Well, they're really, the real problem there is if they never get out of the first stage, they could actually be stopped out of school. So uh, you want them to get strong in math this summer, but maybe uh, you're doing two other classes. You're not going to do a math class in the summer at the two-year college, from two-year college. Well, we offer a summer bridge college math class, and I am the teacher. I'm, I made the curriculum. I'm just excited. I'm going to have about eight students in that class, hopefully all seniors who are rising to college. Um, I already have four or five of the students for that class, and I just need to get three or four more students in that class. Just go to, go to we'll show you at the end, but www.westa-eep.org. Go there and click on the banner for the summer program and sign up for the college math prep class. All right, I'll show you how to do that at the end of this session. We still have openings in the, for the trade tech classes that we're offering for credit. Um, they're exclusively offered to West Angeles program students. We're actually full, but I can take a couple more. Hurry up, email Christina Martinez at cmartinez.eep at gmail.com. Okay, need-based federal aid. Okay, we, we really need to prove to you or show you why do we have to have loans for college? Why is that in general something we have to be worried about? What, what's going on with there? Why do we have federal loans, okay? So uh, let's take a look at this. Need-based federal aid plus, and state grants uh, plus the merit scholarships turns out to be considerably less than the direct cost for college. Very often it is, and there's no need-based, uh, there's not enough need-based aid, you're gonna have to have additional loans for college, and there never is. It's short by at least 6000 to $7,000 regularly, and I'll tell you what most people do about it in just a second. So you have the tuition fees room and board over here on the left. That's the direct cost. Over here on the right, how are we going to pay for it? Well, you have your Pell Grant, Cal Grant, University Grant, and Merit Scholarships, okay? Merit Scholarships. Okay, so those are the three things, or four types of grants, but basically those are all free money, okay? But you can see that this free money is not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough to cover, and this dashed lines up here are the additional monies that are needed to actually do college, to pay for college, to make it the same amount as over here. And that's your dollars from your budget plus loans. So loans are a big part of paying and closing the gap for college. Because right up to here, that line is just the grants. You can see it doesn't cover the whole blue bar, does it? You need those additional uh, dollars plus loans uh, that are covered over here in this dashed line to actually do it, okay? So there are two categories of student loans. Two categories. First, we have direct student loans, also called Stafford loans, and you have, then you have Perkins loans. We'll talk about that in a minute. For parents, we have the parent loan for undergraduate students. Notice the parent loan for undergraduate students is a type of student loan. So when we say student loans, notice we included the parent loan in this. Uh, and I say something about Perkins loans over here, but there are no, I wanted to say there's no such thing as parent Perkins loans, okay? There is no parent Perkins loan. It's just the parent loan for undergraduate students, also called the PLUS loan. On the PLUS loan, there's no loan forgiveness and there is going to be a consumer credit check. So you could be turned down for the PLUS. As I said on the page before, you, you could really need it to pay for college, but you can be turned down for it. I'll cover the conditions under which a PLUS is, de is denied in just a moment. Perkins loans are totally forgivable. They're a student loan that's totally forgivable with volunteer service on the campus typically. 
of about 20 hours per school year. Each school year they have the Perkins loan. There's no credit check for any student loans. Student loans, you get them without any kind of credit check. The direct student loan is the other loan and there is forgiveness for federal government employment, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps service for three years. So if you, if you leave Peace Corps after two years or a year and a half, you don't get forgiveness. Teach for America. Those are, there are also other ways to get forgiveness, but they're not good things that could happen in your life, so I won't cover those. Why, now, why should students pay for college? Why is it okay for them to have a small loan for college? I consider it to be just, just fair as it can be, and I'm gonna to explain to you why in just a moment. Students should pay or owe something for their college education. They will receive something of lifelong value. So they should pay. They are or will become more made motivated to complete college as fast as possible, parents, if they pay for college. So please, parents, give that a second thought for sure as to whether your student should actually pay for college. Okay? All right. Many times parents regret their own student loans and do not want their youth to have any loans. Yes, you can pay their loans or pay the additional costs for college, but it's up to you. You don't have to. The monthly payment is manageable if, a student, if students plan a sustainable career independent of the major. And I'll talk about that next meeting. A life plan is needed to allow loans to be repaid. They need a life plan, not just I'm going to college for fun. There has to be a plan to start a career, and then that career yields a job that will help them pay for their college loans. Let's talk about some other loan facts. Okay, how about some other loan facts? Interest rates for student loans. The direct student loan is 2.75% for Perkins loan too. Parent loans are 4.53%. These were just lower to these levels under the CARES Act, and we think they're gonna remain that way probably from here on. The maximum loan lengths for direct student loans, it's seven years maximum. For a plus loan, it's 10 years maximum. And everything you see here is gonna be based on those lengths. So if you shorten those lengths, uh, you might increase your payments, but you get out of it sooner and you pay less interest. Extensions are possible. You can extend these years, you know, but the costs dramatically increase on the of the loan. Like if you lose your, lose your job temporarily, okay, right, you might suspend your loan. You're making it longer, but you're paying more interest. How about the monthly payments for loans? For the student direct loan, the, ma the maximum monthly payment for seven years at a 2.75% interest rate and you'll see here that it's $27,000. Assuming you take out loans every year, and you take only the, only the maximum amount for your loans, and your payment's gonna be $357.74. You pay that for seven years, you'll pay the $27,000 principal plus, there's that interest, $3,050.16 worth of interest you're gonna pay on that loan. All right, I hope that's very clear to you that over the seven years, you're paying 3,000 additional dollars. Students who pay on time for 3.5 years can get up to three years of loan forgiveness from the federal government. But you know, they'll contact you once you get to that point or as you get closer to it. Okay. First of all, there are two types of student loans. First, we have subsidized, subsidized loans. And that means that the interest is paid by the feds while the student is in college. Interest does accrue six months after the student begins to accrue, six months after the student leaves college. So if a student goes to school for two years, gets in trouble in the third year, has to leave school, they owe for two and a half years of loans six months after they leave college. Of course, if you graduate, we know it's, it's no problem, you owe the loans after graduation. The first year loan is gonna be $3,500, subsidized loan. The second year of the subsidized loan is gonna be $4,500. 
the third and fourth year is going to be $5,500. So that makes a maximum subsidized loan, if you add those up, of $19,000. All right? Unsubsidized loans are $2,000 each year for up to five years, plus two additional $4,000 per year that the plus is rejected. And if your parents' loan is turned down, you get an additional $4,000 of unsubsidized loans, okay? The maximum subsidized loans, when you add all that up, is $22,000. So if you get all unsubsidized loans and the plus loans were turned down each of the four semesters, four years that you're in college, you'd have $22,000 in unsubsidized loan plus $19,000, remember, in subsidized or about $41,000 in student loans. But that's extremely rare. The average student loan as of yesterday or two days ago when I looked, is $23,000. That's the average student loan, $23,000. And you'll find, you remember earlier, that's about $357 a month for seven years or $400 a month if you want to do it in five and a half years. Okay, so you can see the loan, the monthly payment for that loan actually is quite manageable. And you might find yourself able to take care of that out of your first job. But actually, we'll have some budgets I'll show you where the student is making. 35,000 a year can easily make that payment and more actually and get it paid sooner and it will eat just well and be able to pay 12, 1300 a month in rent. So that's a good amount to shoot for for your first job, $35,000. Here's a typical four year West AEP student. I included three and a half because quite a few of my students finished college at three and a half years. You can see on these loans what we're looking at, right? Okay. Uh, 3.5 years of college, you can see that the maximum subsidized loan uh, is 12,250 unsubsidized 7,000 or about 20,000. And for four years of college, you can see that it's 14,000 plus 8,000 or about $2,000 in loans, 22,000 in loans. So you can see that 20 to 23, 22,000 is about where most students end up after they leave college. How about the monthly payments for these loans? The Parent PLUS loan, we didn't cover uh, Parent PLUS loans, I'm sorry, we covered direct student loans. It's a 4.53% interest rate for 10 years, 120 months. It's a $474.62 payment, and it's assumed principal of 45,000, which is about what you would have maximum for a CSU, you can go, I've seen them as low as parent loans of 26,000, 25,000, even for four years of CSU. But this is the worst case, could be 45,000. And then you gotta pay $11,954.40 over 10 years of interest. So really you're paying 56,000 when you borrow, well, well over 50, almost 57,000 when you, when you borrow $45,000, okay? There's currently no forgiveness for parent loans. That's the PLUS loan. Here are two tables for you that you can consult. <clears throat> you see the left-hand table we have here is for direct student loans. There's the table for it. Goes out, goes well below the 40,000. Usually gonna be right around here, students. There's that 278 a month. At 26, there's your 350 a month that you're paying. I think I have 27 on the other page, okay? So those are your monthly charge, monthly payments over seven years, 84 months. Parents, yours are over here. So if you end up owing 174,000 in parent loans, which is about 40,000 a year, parents, you'll pay $1,835.20 per month for 10 years on a payment of 474.62. So if you can pay a little more, you can make it happen sooner. If you can pay seven or 800 a month, you can knock this loan out of the way in about four years. I figured that out before. Maybe even three years, okay? But that is a, a debt you're gonna have as a parent and it's coming at a time where you're getting ready to retire. So it's not that easy to make those payments. By the way, this chart here was updated for the CARES and COVID Act, COVID Act that was done about a month ago by Congress and these interest rates were adjusted downward, okay? I think I showed charts earlier with higher interest rates. That's why I'm bringing that up. How do I activate my student direct loan? All right, well, 
two steps. You want to complete the student loan counseling. You want to complete the promissory note. You want to go to www.studentloans.gov. You want to log in with your FAFSA usernames and passwords for both the student loans and the parent loan. And you want to click, I am preparing for college. And you want to first complete the loan entrance counseling. Then you want to complete the promissory note. Both of let's see, the loan entrance counseling is very tedious. It will take you about an hour to do. The promissory note you can do in about 10 minutes. And I need students to do these right away, by the way. You really want to do that. Get it out of the way because the colleges are needing that money to start preparing the campus for your student next semester. They'll claim that they don't know they're not going to enroll your student. So you want to get that done so you have no problem with registering for classes. What's the results of direct loan activation? The counseling results and the promissory note are sent to the college or university. You get a copy of the promissory note to your email box too, but they get it. They need to see you signed it. The college or university receives dollars from the feds. It, well, it should be receives, not received up. This is actually present tense. So get those dollars from the feds. You never even see the loan monies. They go directly to the college. You receive the promissory note in your email though. The loan provider then sends you correspondence on how to make payments each quarter, but it's deferred. You don't have to make payments till you leave college, or you can make payments while you're in college and reduce the principal for when you leave. It'll be quicker paying off your loan if you can make some kind of payment while you're in school. Okay, let's talk about payment alternatives to the PLUS loan before we get into that. Do I have to do a PLUS loan or any other alternatives? Well, I did a session two weeks ago where I talked about these things. So I'm going to go over them again here. You could take a loan against a 401k, a 403b, or your deferred 457, that should be four, plan. If you have some kind of, if you're a city worker or a state worker, you have a deferred plan. You've been putting money away or the state has for you. And I, I think it's half-half. You can just take loans against that. How about withdrawals from these above? I recommend against withdrawals, but that's a quick, fast way to take care of that additional cost. Again, I'm considering alternatives to the parent loan if you don't want to do the parent loan. Loans from a relative, as I explained earlier, there could be strings attached. Can you raise your income? Sometimes people, when one student's left the house, now it's easy for them to raise additional income. Payroll withholding change, yep. You can change your, withhold, change your withholding on your payroll anticipating deductions you'll have, and you get more money back in your check, maybe your plus loan doesn't have to be as much. Consult your CPA or your accountant or your tax preparer, or even HR, they can help you with that as well, understanding how much money you'd actually get back. A payroll withholding change could be a possibility. Or we talked last week about, last meeting, about major budget reductions, such as your sibling school, does it have to be a private school, can it be a public school? technology reductions for cable and internet, car sales and payoffs. These are all things that can reduce your costs and have more money in your pocket so your PLUS loan can be smaller. Parent loan, important things to know. The loan is a federal government loan, not a consumer loan. It's, it's not a bank loan, it's a federal government loan, the parent loan for undergraduate students. Yes, you can find a similar loan, that's a student loan, but the interest will be 14.5% 4 above, and you'll have to be the co-borrower, which will make it your loan anyhow. It will go on your credit record, not only your students. So that's why it's not a popular choice, but you can do that too if you want to put the loan in their name. <clears throat> you start the process by asking your youth's chosen college about their process for the PLUS loan, because sometimes, you might find out that it might be a case where you go to the school first, you know, for the, for the loan and they actually submit it for you. You'll get a commercial credit check by a TransUnion or some other credit reporting company. You'll be initially rejected if any one of the following circumstances is true. If you have a federal state income tax lien or levy, you'll be turned down for the PLUS loan. If you have a default on any payment agreement, you, could, you, you will not be eligible if it's in the credit record. Mortgage foreclosure last five years, it's, it's a problem. Chapter nine or 11 bankruptcy discharge of debts in the last five years, 
Chapter 13 is okay if you have that. A change of, of existing or an existing, a charge off or an existing 90 day delinquency of more than $2,085 on a debt. Voluntary or involuntary repossession, that's in your record, that's a problem. And write off uh, on an existing federal student loan debt, if you've written that off, that's a problem for you getting a plus loan. I know what you're thinking, how does anybody get eligible? But it really isn't too hard because you can appeal some of these. So if any of you are turned down for your PLUS loan, for one of these reasons, you need to contact me before you give up hope that you'll get it. But you could appeal and do something that will help you to get the award. Um, so the intent of the government is to make this, this loan pretty easy to get, but it is a debt. And so they have a right to look into these things. If you're not approved for a PLUS loan, you'll be offered an additional $4,000 in direct student loan. Actually, your student will be offered uh, an additional $4,000 in direct student loan, and you will need to pay cash for the remainder of the gap costs. Uh, so that's quite a repercussion there. It sometimes causes people to not send their students to college because the PLUS loan was not approved and they can't afford to pay cash. If you're approved for a PLUS, half of the loan will be made available for fall semester and the other half will be made available for spring. Both will be available 10 days prior to the first day of class. Be sure to check off that you want, the, when you're applying for the loan online, that you want the school to calculate the amount of the plus because you don't want the student to have any shortage of funds. You just have a lot of uncertainties. I'd rather you get a refund ch check back from the government then have the student need something you can't get any more loan. Because sometimes you can't reapply for that loan in time to take care of the problem. Um, the loan will cover all the costs and you just, if you do the loan and, and you check that, let them calculate it, it'll cover everything that their financial aid does not cover, and especially these one-time costs. If you are approved, for, remember you get a refund, you know, if you're over. If you, if you are approved for a plus, Half the loan will be available fall, half spring. I told you that. And well, how about the steps for getting a plus? Like I said, contact the school. Ask if, if there's a form that you have to fill out first. In a lot of schools there is. And they may apply for you. You know, and that's fine too. They'll probably send you to the website after all once they do what they have to do and tell you the things they need to tell you. You're logging with your FAFSA username and password, not, not your youths. Remember I said before, the youth will log in with theirs for their loan, but you log in with your username and password. It's your loan, not their loan. Look for apply for plus, click and follow all the steps. Click that you want the school to determine the amount of the plus. I just told you that before, I'm telling you again. Click that you, you, that you received the refund, not the student. Make sure you have the refund going to you. It says me. Make sure it goes to me, the parent, not to the student. Then you get that refund. It pays you back for your costs that you put out for college, for books, for air travel, technology. It's paying you back for that, okay? You will know in 20 to 30 seconds if you're approved. That site is very fast. You'll know if you're approved. If approved, then click on Master Promissory Note. You complete that promissory note, and the, the loan funds will come into the school to pay off the gap costs for school. Active on now, student behaviors that can reduce Apparently, I gave a lot more than these, but here's some of the big ones to remind you. If the student is active on the campus, you know, because they're gonna need to get two or three roommates off campus in the next years, you know, hopefully students that share their values. So they wanna meet people, they gotta meet people and be active on the campus. It's the only way I know to meet people. You can save a lot of money, 30, 30 to 50% parents can save in costs if they have roommates. One major, one for sure that one major is related to a career because you want to be paying off your loans when you leave college. Uh, you want to be able to get a career that you can help your parents pay that plus maybe, okay? Yeah. Student behaviors, again, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Student behaviors in college that tend to reduce the plus loan. Classes in summer, General, like general education classes, please start this summer. As I said, Trade Tech is offering classes exclusive to our students online. So you might want to get in on that, get a hold of Christina Martinez. 
be proactive, take actions to prevent D's and F's. Okay, don't let that happen to you, students. We want you to take those actions. Develop a study process that works. We'll be covering this in future meetings. And academically, prepare yourself for college writing, college math, and biology this coming summer. We've talked about that. Please prepare yourself, especially for math and science. I don't want to see you get into trouble and then have to stop out or leave school early, or even worse, you know, don't do well, and uh, you're just not getting ready for your career properly. And finally, this is the stuff we're going to cover in future sessions. We're going to talk about how to purchase books, give you more of the registering for classes, teach you how that goes, how to manage your professor, how to read your syllabus, and how to build a successful career. All right, I want to thank you very much for looking at this video. I hope it's going to help you uh, and help your student parents uh, in the proper enrollment in, for college and setting up those loans. Don't forget, go out there to studentloans.gov, set those loans up, and start on it now. Don't let that pile up as something you've not done. God bless you. I'm glad you could join me. Bye-bye now.